Hello, everyone. Good morning. Happy Monday. Let me know if you can hear me okay. Hello, teacher. Yes, I can hear you. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Ale, Demaris, Elizabeth, Vanessa, Mariana, Omar. I want to get right into it, guys, today. Um, this is our final week of our of our class, uh, academic and creative writing. Our goal for this week, we're kind of moving now. We've completed the fourth unit of academic or creative writing, I should say, with uh, completing four different poems this week. We're going to dedicate our time primarily to the e-portfolio. So part of the course requirement is not only the completion of products for each of the four units, but also completing an e-portfolio. So today I want to spend some time talking with you and giving you some ideas about how you can think about not only what to include in your e-portfolio, but also where you can post or publish your e-portfolio uh, if you haven't already done so. Now, some of you who have taken me uh, in prior classes, you may have already had some experience with an e-portfolio. Um, either way, if you have a space already that you developed either in a class that you've taken with me or in another instructor, you're encouraged to keep that same space. If it's something that you like to use, that you've been using in the past and you want to continue using in the future, then by all means, feel free to continue using that space. Um, but I want to give you some ideas here today about uh, some options, some online spaces that are all free that you can also use. Before we get into that, though, I want to um, I want to remind everyone that I know some of you who uh, some of you who completed the first essay want a second chance to resubmit an essay for the first unit for for an improved grade. So I'm giving everyone who has completed the third uh, the second or the third unit, the second essay, an opportunity to resubmit for their first. What I mean by that is, if you need to have completed the essay for unit three in order to can be considered to resubmit the first essay for unit one. So if you're in that situation and you want to uh, work on and resubmit an essay for unit one, then you might want to also be working on that this week. I'm going to give uh, next week, next week we're starting uh, the exams week, for this class, there's no exam. There's no final exam uh, for this class. So uh, if you have, if you're happy with your your grades for the first, well, for the first uh, unit, and you're not going to be resubmitting, then our this will be our last week. I'll be online again next week, only for those of you who want to resubmit the academic essay for unit one. Okay. Now, I will also say if anyone has questions about their essay, if you are working on it this week, which I encourage you to, to do, we can meet. Uh, or if you want to send me a, a message, if you have any questions or you want me to look at something this week, then you can post, you can, you can do that. You can send me a message in the chat and uh, we can be working on that starting this week. But the live sessions for this week are going to primarily be uh, directed towards the e-portfolio, okay? The e-portfolio and an educational philosophy, which we'll get into here in a moment. All right, so let me go ahead and share my screen. And we'll first start in the virtual classroom, all right? So in the virtual classroom, now we have a new section called e-portfolio. And I've included under readings the presentation that I want to go over very briefly uh, today, briefly in the sense that the, the presentation is quite long. There's a lot of information in there. And the intention for this presentation, this sway basically, is to, to put in 
basically a, all the information that you would need to get a really good idea about suggestions about completing your own e-portfolio. Um, if I were to go through and talk about everything in here, it, it would be a rather long presentation. So we're just I'm just going to touch today on some of the high points and uh, try to bring out some ideas that you might want to consider, especially as uh, learners in our BA program. Okay, so a lot of the information that I'm sharing in this presentation on e-portfolios is related towards, specifically related to uh, those who are studying uh, teaching uh, English. Okay, so we're going to be looking at that here in a moment. We're going to have basically two assignments for this week for the e-portfolio. The one assignment is for the e-portfolio itself, and we'll talk about that here in greater detail in a second. The second is a smaller assignment, but it's part of, it's something we're going to include in the e-portfolio, and that's called an educational philosophy. And we'll talk about that today as well. All right, so this week we're going to be primarily focusing on an educational philosophy and in the overall e-portfolio. So, let's get into the presentation. All right, so the e-portfolio. The e-portfolio, um, I, I use the term e-portfolio, but it's really a personal and professional e-portfolio. There are many types of portfolios or e-portfolios, um, but for our purposes, it needs to be professional in the sense that any information that you include in your e-portfolio, I would consider it something that you would be happy to share in a job interview. All right. So there are many types of portfolios that could be more socially related, that could be more informal. But for our purposes, it's going to be personal in that you're going to uh, – it's, it's going to be basically all about you. And it's going to be professional in the sense that it's going to show basically your skills – or your understandings of um, of the the content that you learn primarily in the BA and also through your experiences as a practicing teacher. It's also going to include your skills. How can you demonstrate your skills to others? And the third thing, your disposition or your attitude or values. I kind of throw those three together. They're they're very similar. Um, but essentially, there are three things, knowledge, skills, and your disposition, okay? So again, disposition, your attitude, your values uh, as a person, as a professional. And it's all going to be related to the your profession, in this case, teaching and learning or education. Now, when you're thinking about developing a... Uh, an e-portfolio, think about the audience. Think about the potential audience, all right? For me, the easiest thing to think about is when you are preparing for an interview. Who might you interview with? It could be a principal, a school principal, or a director. It might be a coordinator of a program that you're interested in uh, working for. Could even be a committee, depending on how they hire. Okay, sometimes you go into a hiring committee, and there might be a panel of uh, people there that might be part of the process. It could also be sometimes when you go through an interview, there may there may be three or four or five stages of an interview depending on the process, right? So there there are likely to be several different types of people that might be involved in who might this potential audience be. But I think it's important to think about. Uh, even at, from the very beginning, who might see this, right? Regardless of whether or not you've already had interviews in the past. Maybe you've never had a job interview. But think about the, uh, the types of people who are likely to be in an interview and think about what you would be happy to share with them in that, in that online space. Okay, we're using the term e-portfolio to refer to an online public space where you're sharing to the world your uh, your knowledge, your skills, and your disposition. All right, so always keep that in mind. 
Now, one of the things that I talk about early on in this presentation is the importance of having an educational philosophy. And again, this is going to be one of our assignments for this week. Now, an educational philosophy, this is something very important, and I think it's implicit in basically any job interview that you either have had or will have uh, in the future. But it basically, an inner, uh, educational philosophy, when somebody sits down with you and they're asking you questions about, you know, what do you know? They're asking you questions about, um, you know, what do you think about, you know, how do you view teaching? You know, how do you uh, view learning in your own particular type of classes that you teach. They're essentially asking you for your educational philosophy. They want to know what your philosophy is on education, on teaching and learning. Again, they may not use this word educational philosophy, but all the types of questions that they're asking you, essentially that is what they want to know. They want to know what, how you view, right, the how students learn, how you learn as a teacher, how you teach maybe some of the materials that you use in your classes. So some of the questions here that I think are helpful in prompting uh, someone to think about uh, when they're looking and reflecting on their own educational philosophy are the following questions. Why do I want to teach? Okay, They may even ask you this question right in an interview. Why do you want to teach? Okay, so... When you're thinking about your educational philosophy, what's the purpose of you as an individual, as a teacher, as a facilitator, however you want to uh, categorize yourself in the classroom, why do you do it, right? You might ask, um, how do you go about teaching, right? How do, you, how do you approach it, right? It could be something general. Or it could be very, very specific about maybe a particular type of technology or maybe a course book, they may ask you, how do you use a course book in your own classroom? Like, how do you implement the, the, the course, the, the, the book itself, if they have a, a book that's part of their, the school system? That might be a question that they might ask you. Uh, where do you want to teach and to whom would you like to teach? All right, these are four general types of questions that you can reflect on. We're going to look at some additional questions that get into some of the specifics, but I think these four general questions, why do I teach? Whom would I, who am I teaching or who would I like to teach? Right? So who are these, who are the students that you are going to be uh, working with? How and what am I going to teach? And where am I going to teach? Where am I going to teach? That uh, is an interesting question because one might think, well, okay, I'm going to teach in Aguas Calientes, or I'm going to teach abroad in another country, right? But it could also mean, given the, the amount of technologies now that we have, it could even say, well, it could even mean, where do you teach in terms of online spaces, right? So right now, we're, we're teaching, I'm teaching, and we're learning in uh, Microsoft Teams, we're using a Moodle platform in a, in a virtual classroom. So we could also talk about where someone teaches in terms of the online platform that they use. And that would also extend to a fifth question, well, when do you teach? Like, when do you teach? And that's another inter interesting question to, to reflect on when you're thinking about your educational philosophy. Like, do you teach everything at the beginning? Like right now, I'm, te I'm teaching all this, all this information about educational philosophy from at the very beginning, right? Maybe there's a, another approach where we, I don't teach about anything about educational philosophy or, or e-portfolios until at the very end and have students first interact with information online or with themselves. So these are general questions to think about when you're reflecting on your own educational philosophy. Now, here are some specific questions, and we're not going to go through all 10 of these, but again, I want to sh give you kind of an overview, and uh, I'm going to encourage everyone to go back to this presentation and really dig deeper into some of uh, the information here that's, uh, that's being shared. But some of these questions, and they all stem primarily from those four questions that we just talked about, but 
what do you believe uh, is the grander purpose of education in society? So not just for the school, but for society, for maybe the community here in Aguascalientes. What's the 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 purpose of education in terms of the city of Aguascalientes or the state of Aguascalientes, right? So you can you can kind of look back and try to offer a, an explanation about what that what that looks like. What's your role as a teacher, right? So part of your educational philosophy could be talking about, well, I'm going to be a facilitator. Okay, this is a common common response. I'm going to facilitate learning, and that's fine as long as in your description, you're you're specifically talking about well, what does that actually mean? And and are you always a facilitator, one hundred percent? Is that the only role that you play? So a lot of times, this question about well, what role do you take as a teacher doesn't necessarily mean that you assume one role. In fact, I think we would most of us would agree that we're we're going to assume a lot of different types of roles as teachers. How do you believe students can learn best? You might get this in a job interview, right? This is something really good to put into a, an educational philosophy. Remember, an educational philosophy is going to also appear in your e-portfolio. So you're telling the world. You're basically shouting from the rooftops. This is how I think students learn. This is my educational philosophy. In general, what are your goals for your students? What do you want your students, your learners, to achieve? What objectives do you have for them? And, you know, the, the common answer is going to be whatever the objectives are stated by the school, right? But they're probably going to want to know more from you personally. What is your own philosophy on your own goals? It's okay to have maybe separate goals, concurrent goals, right, for your students that as long as they align with the the objectives of the of the school, right? You're going to also pursue certain goals that relate to your own particular philosophy. What qualities do you believe in an a, an effective teacher should have? What is an effective teacher? What does it mean to be effective? What does it mean to be efficient? What does it mean to be engaging? Right? These are relative questions that relate to this, this central question of being an, an effective teacher. Right? Effectiveness, efficiency, and engagement. What's the relationship between those three? Do you believe that all learners, all students can learn? What do teachers owe their students? What, do you, what obligation do you have to your students? Okay, This is something that you could include in your educational philosophy. What is your overall goal? Where do you want to be in three years, five years, ten years? And how, how do you create an inclusive learning environment? What does it mean to be exclusive versus inclusive? How can you make your class more inclusive? Is that a good thing? How is it a good thing? Why is it a good thing? How do you incorporate new techniques, activities, and types of learning? This is an interesting question. How do you incorporate? How do you bring in and use new technologies? This, I think, speaks to you as, as a learner, as an ongoing, continuous learner, a lifelong learner. Right? And this is a catchphrase that a lot of people use. I'm a lifelong learner. Okay, well, what does that mean? This question gets to that, that point. Right. If you're going to say, I'm a lifelong learner, you want to back that up with some concrete ideas about techniques and activities and types of learning that how do you learn the best? And how does the way that you learn help or hinder the way you teach your students? Do your students learn the same way that you learn? Right. All those types of questions come into play. And and your awareness of how you learn versus how your students learn, I think, is not only just a, an, a good uh, exercise, a thinking exercise, but also something that I think will benefit you if you can articulate and explain to someone how do you learn and how might that even interfere with you teaching other students if they don't happen to learn the same way that you learn. Okay, so all these types of questions come to mind 
And you don't have to answer all of these questions, all right? For our purposes, the educational philosophy is going to be one paragraph, one five to eight sentence paragraph. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be a five paragraph essay. It's going to be very short, it needs to be concise, and it needs to answer as many of these questions that you think are most relevant. Again, I'm trying to offer you a lot of different options, a lot of different ways of thinking about your educational philosophy, but try to dig deep into some of these questions and get into some of the specifics when you're developing your one paragraph, five to eight sentence paragraph for your, for your educational philosophy. All right, so again, this is going to be one of our assignments for this week. I'm going to ask you to post this. It's going to be both assignments are going to be due the on Friday, all right, at the end of the day, uh, on Friday. So we're going to have all week to work on this <clears throat> on this paragraph on this educational philosophy. But again, uh, once you post it and upload it as an assignment, I'm going to also ask that you include it in your uh, e-portfolio. All right, well, I'm going to move on. There's some videos in here as well, guys. So uh, again, I encourage you to kind of go back through this presentation all week, essentially. And as you are developing your own e-portfolio, revisit this presentation uh, to get some ideas. Now, what to include? Now, what should we include? Now, my discussion today is going to be very specific to you as, as, a, uh, as a student in our own BA. And because our BA is broken down into strands, I think it's also a good idea to think about how you can organize your own e-portfolio based on the strands that we have in our curriculum. All right, so I'm going to break it down into what I'm going to call standards, but they're basically the same strands that we have in our BA. Now, I should mention that although I'm asking certain uh, requirements for our e-portfolio for this class, I'm going to be encouraging everyone to include any type of product, any type of acknowledgement, any work that you've done, videos, audios, documents, essays, poems, anything that you've completed in the BA in any class, I'm going to encourage you to include in your e-portfolio. For a grade, I'm only going to ask that you include the products that we've completed for this course. So I'm not grading you on anything else other than what we completed in units one, two, three, and four of this class. Two academic essays, the business correspondence products that we completed in unit two, and the four poems that we included uh, that we completed in unit four. That's what I'm going to be grading on. But if you have, maybe you completed some work in another class this same semester, maybe you have some work that you're proud of that you want to share from prior semesters. I encourage you to include it in your e-portfolio. So in that, keeping that in mind, one way to organize your e-portfolio is through standards that are going to be based on, again, the different strands. One of the strands we have in our BA, and it just so happens that the class that we're taking here now falls under this strand, the skills development uh, in English communication. So this standard, or this strand, relates basically to any type of artifact. Again, an artifact can be an image, a video, an audio. It can be basically anything that you completed, an essay, right? It can be anything that maybe it's a, an observation, a reflection that you did for maybe a class that you taught. All of these are potential uh, products. But think about maybe the products that you completed for the courses that fall under this strand, skills development in English communication. Again, this class happens to be one of them. Achisei was another. In the first and second semesters, you, you completed Achisei. Anything in, that, in those courses could also would fall under this strand. If you took Prope, anything in any of those classes essentially would, follow, would fall under this strand, skills development 
in English communication. Later on, you're going to take courses in uh, academic writing in seventh semester. That course is also going to fall under this. Maybe even your eighth semester class, your advanced reading, your public speaking classes. All of those classes are designed to help you develop the English skill so that you are the most proficient and articulate English speaker when you leave the BA. So think of this, this first standard as basically any products that you've completed that you're proud of or any acknowledgments that relate to your skill development could fall under this. You could also include your TOEFL scores, right? If you want to share those, you could share those as well under this standard. All right, so those are some examples of uh, this standard that you can include. And I'm just including here, you could you could divide it up into, uh, you know, by, based on speaking and writing if you want. You know, there's a lot of different ways. And what I'm sharing with you here is not the only way, of course. And it's not even, you know, I, I want to give you an idea about how you can organize it. And w when we start talking about online spaces, we can look at some some examples of how you might design the platform itself. But think about how within the strand, how you might divide this up, right? And since the production, everything falls typically under either speaking or writing, then one way obviously is to break it down into those subcategories, that one standard. Now, the second standard relates to applied linguistics. So just like in the BA, you have classes that are specifically related to applied linguistics, psycholinguistics, the linguistics class itself, discourse analysis. We have a course on applied, linguistic, uh, apply, applied linguistics. So anything that you complete in this strand, you could include here. If you're doing action research, right, in applied linguistics, and you produce a, a paper that you're particularly happy with, and you want to share that, then that would fall under this, this particular uh, standard. Again, there are different ways that you could divide this up. Standard 2.1, maybe one's related to grammar, maybe another, another one's related to phonology, English literature, maybe, right? It just depends on how you want to divide it up. This is not the only way, and you could argue maybe it's not even the best way, but it is a way to think about how you can organize it. Standard number three, teaching methodology. So we have a lot of courses in teaching methodology. Here you might have some examples of maybe a video and maybe even a, an audio reflection or a text reflection on maybe one of your, uh, your teaching performances, right? If something went very well for you and you reflected, it could even be something that went poorly but through the reflection, you're demonstrating that you learned something from that experience, then that, I think, would be something to be proud of and something that you could share with others. So an e-portfolio doesn't necessarily mean that you're showing all this great stuff that you did. You could show evidence of your learning, and that would mean showing some some things, some some. Uh, some experiences that maybe started off that you didn't know a lot, but you're demonstrating that you were learning over time. That could also be very powerful when you're using your e-portfolio in that job interview. Remember that an e-portfolio is to accompany your resume. So imagine you're going into a job interview, you're going to present a resume, a summary of your, your skills and your understandings. And your disposition, same idea, but it's going to be in text form usually. And then you're going to say, okay, I've also have an e-portfolio. You're welcome to take a look at my e-portfolio, and that's going to complement very much. In fact, it may even be more powerful than the resume itself. Again, because they're seeing this explicit information about what you know, what you can do, and your disposition, your attitudes, your values. So here, standard number three, teaching methodology. Okay, we can break this down into however you want. Maybe it's it's broken down into level, right? If you have some experience teaching children versus teaching adults, you might divide it up in, in that way. Maybe you divide it up by level, level lower levels versus more advanced levels. 
Okay, it just depends on your your own uh, particular context. Standard uh, number four, teaching practicum. All right, so again, the teaching methodology is going to be more theoretically based. Again, going to be products that are related more towards the theory aspect of it, whereas teaching practicum is going to be more um, based on your teaching practice. Okay, so I, I think I, I jumped ahead there a little bit. Teaching methodology, again, is going to be more theoretically based. All right, so any type of uh, teaching methodologies, uh, maybe the, t the uh, English, the methodologies of teaching English, right? You can sh talk about those, those aspects. Okay, I lost my place here. And, and then the teaching practicum is going to be more, I think, related to the, the reflection aspect of it and maybe sharing videos of you and your own, maybe you in the classroom. Or it could be even a, a team teaching situation where you're teaching with other uh, classmates or other professionals and you're reflecting on that experience. Okay, so those are basically four different standards and, and categories that you can break down your, your artifacts, right? Those objects that you're going to be including in your ePortfolio. All right, so here I have a list of very specific types of artifacts. Okay, so you can have artifacts that relate to knowledge of subject matter, human knowledge, adapting instruction, multiple instructional strategies. There's a long list here of specific types of artifacts that you could organize in your e in your ePortfolio. It's really important whether you follow the example that I'm uh, sharing here or you you follow something else, you follow a different way of organizing. The key point here is that there is a logical organization to your ePortfolio. You don't want to just throw up in, uh, information and when st when someone goes into the ePortfolio, they have a hard time navigating and finding information. So it really needs to be organized so that somebody going into it the first time can really find what they're looking for, that they can see who you are and find information about, about yourself. Now, the question about where to host an ePortfolio. All right, we're going to talk about that here today. I have some videos included in the presentation, but again, you know, go back and take a look at that. Some of these videos are older. Some of the platforms have come and gone. And I, I leave these in here purposefully because I think it's important to realize that, yes, some of these platforms do come and go. So if you're thinking about a new space for the first time, I would highly recommend that you choose a space that you think is going to be around for a little while. Or certainly one that would be easy or fairly easy to move if for any reason you need to move. Because, well, I guess, you know, nothing is forever, I guess you could say. Uh, some of these technologies do come and go. Uh, Google Sites is an interesting one because they kind of came and went. They, they had an old version of their site and then they implemented a new version. And I think this screenshot, this thumbnail here, is a screenshot of the old Google Sites that I'm not sure even exist anymore. I know in my case I had uh, some information here that uh, was a little bit difficult to, to move from the old site to the new site. I think I tried it, but it, it was not really successful. So Wikispa Wikispaces no longer exists. Uh, it's gone. So it does try to keep that in mind. If you don't have to use the examples that I have provided here, but please make sure that you decide on something that you think is going to be around for a little while, or again, you think is easy enough to basically move from one site to the next in the event that the service no longer will be available. All right, so here I've got um, a list, and I think that my top three choices uh, for, well, there's actually four choices here that I could talk about. Wix and Weebly, I think students tend to go with Wix. Uh, we'll look at Wix here in a minute. 
but when I give this presentation, I give a similar presentation every semester, every time I teach this class. And for whatever reason, students, almost all students choose Wix. Now, Wix, I think, is a good choice. This is my personal opinion, but this is, again, your choice. You decide how, who, which space that you want to use. Wix has a lot of options. It's a little bit more robust. It's more feature-rich than Weebly. They're very similar, but I think Weebly is a little bit more user-friendly. Um, but students really like Wix, and I think you can do more with Wix. I think you can do a lot more th with Wix that you really need to for certainly for the purposes of this assignment, but even for maintaining an e-portfolio. It, it really is having your own website. And if you want to think about this as having your own website, that's fine, right? However you want to view it. But I'm going to be calling it an e-portfolio because, again, I want <clears throat> to think of it <clears throat> as keeping or having a space of specific types of products that demonstrate your knowledge, your skills, and your disposition. So let's take a look at some examples here. So this is Wix. You'll have to create an account with basically all of these services. And you basically just begin developing your own, your own space. And I don't know if I have... I set one up a while back, but I don't know if I can get to my email. I'll, I'll try to pull this up a little bit later. Throughout this whole week, I'm going to be going into uh, these websites with you and, and answering any questions that you have or technical issues that you have if you have problems setting up your ePortfolio. Um, but for now, we'll just say that Wix is, is a good option here to, to consider and Weebly. Weebly, I do have a Weebly site that I have used more than Wix. Let's see if I can pull that up. And I actually had I had the free version for a while. I then I paid for a service for a little while, and then I went back to the free service. But this is what it looks like. And again, for me personally, I just like Wix. It's a it's a click and drag system. It's a lot easier, and you can still do everything that you need to do when creating an e-portfolio. It's going to take a second to load up here. I think I need to change that. All right, so here in Weebly, and Wix is similar, but it's, again, I think Weebly is a little bit uh, user more user-friendly. But you'll notice here that on the left-hand side, there are different types of content that you can bring into your page. So this is my web page here, and I'm in the dashboard, right? So this is not what obviously what the page looks like when it's published. This is me in the background actually developing this. And so you can go in here and click and drag any of these these objects, okay? And you can change them, modify them. Some are hypertext, there are headings, icons, links. I've embedded a, 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 twit, a tweet space here that has where I tweet uh, in Twitter. And it has all of these contents, these types of information that I can just pull in. Right? If I want, let's see, a text, let's see a title down here at the bottom, I just click and drag, and it's that easy. And I can type in heading. And then if I want text underneath, I just click and drag under there, and then I'm off to the races. Okay, so that's that's it. If I want to delete this section, I just hover over and click there and click there. It's gone. Sure, yes, I do. And if you want to publish, you publish here. And... Yeah, so right now I'm getting some error messages because I had a paid account and I don't have one now. But if you go in with the with the free account, you're not going to have problems uh, with uh, with publishing your your own e-portfolio using this type of interface. Now here under pages, I'll just mention this: you can set up however many pages you want. If you notice here, I have at the top these are all pages and even sub pages and sub pages of that. So 
here I have different pages that are basically they are appear here on the left hand side and you can click and drag and move these pages anywhere you want and th this is a sub page of the channel and so on okay so you can get and this is what I was talking about earlier when I was mentioning about organizing your ideas you're going to be thinking about okay what kind of uh, menu do I need here at the top how do I want to organize these menus based on maybe the standards that I mentioned or another system another way of organizing your ideas but the key here is to be able to find the content all right one of the ways I'm going to grade your ePortfolio is how easy is it that uh, I can find your content sometimes I I have to send messages to students to say well I, I can't find your your academic essay, your first academic essay for unit one. And maybe it's in there, but I can't find it, right? Obviously it's different if they it just didn't upload it, but sometimes they upload it and I just can't find it. So think about how you can create these menus, right? And choose a platform that's easy for you, right? To use, right? That you can easily bring in and add to these menus and they for the most part already have themes set up so you don't have to be a designer you don't have to uh, get into the the specifics of programming anything it's pretty much there you just basically click in add images and uh, text and documents and files however you need to now the next thing here the last port the last uh, example google sites Google Sites, uh, it's been a while since I've used Google Sites, but Google Sites, if you're into Google, like if you're already using maybe Google Docs, um, you know, you can certainly upload files. Um, is this the old one? Let me see. Okay, this is actually the old Google Sites. Um, this is how it used to look. And um, this was something that I used to use back in the day. But they have now the new Google Sites. Let's see if I can find that. And the new Google Sites, I think, is a little bit more user friendly. And it looks something like this. Now, let's see. I really, let's see, this is something here. Let me open this up. All right, so you'll notice here, this is how the new Google Sites looks. All right, so there, there are going to be some similarities in the concepts here. You're going to have pages. You can have pages just like what I showed you in Weebly. You could create sub pages. In this case, I was thinking about a page for each week for writing a literature review. This is for a thesis seminar class. But see here, you could add content. I'm having a hard time here putting the. Is there, okay. Uh, you can add headers, select a background, duplicate sections. These are all sections, right, that you can include. But here, you could insert. What can you insert? You can insert a text box, click and drag over. You can insert images. You can embed things. If you're using your Google Drive, you can bring in files from your Google Drive. Of course, YouTube is also an option. You can embed a YouTube video. Here, there are different ways to add table of contents. I mean, a lot of different things you can do here. So if you're into Google, certainly Google Sites is going to be around for a while. You're not going to be too concerned about uh, something happening to this website. And if you're you know, into, they use Google Classroom as well, that integrates very well with uh, the website. So I think if I had to choose three, Wix, Weebly, or Google Sites, uh, I think are really good options. I will share with you one more. This is a PD Works, I think is the name of it. If you're into wikis, Wikispaces no longer exist, but PB Works, this is a wiki that I think is a good option. If you're comfortable and familiar with the way wikis work, having, and it's much like how we've uh, worked with uh, wikis in the virtual classroom where you have a published page 
and you have an edit page. So this is an example of a wiki and you can edit as the owner of this wiki. You can go in and create all kinds of wiki pages and organize them however you want. It's very user friendly and you can navigate over here with the different pages. Okay, so I just want to give you a, a just a, a quick overview this first day of these different sites. And you don't have to choose these sites, but again, make sure that you choose one that you think is going to be around for a while simply so that you don't lose your information or that you're not having to go back later and change everything because a company decided no longer to, to continue with, with the service. So Wix, Weebly, Google Sites, or PBWorks if you're into uh, a wiki format. All right. Um, let's show, okay, Creative Commons. Um, Creative Commons, for right now, the thing I wanna mention about Creative Commons is anything that you share, guys, online, especially with images, and we'll talk about images here in a minute, but I'm gonna ask you to share some images in your ePortfolio. Now, when you share images, you need to make sure that you have rights, that you have permission, essentially, to publish that image in your portfolio because you're publishing it to the world. It's not like it's just for your purposes, for your eyes only. This is for the whole world to see. So you're going to need to have permission to uh, use that image in your ePortfolio. Luckily, now we have images, videos, we have works now that are under what's called a Creative Commons license. Basically what that means is that you don't need to go out and get permission to use someone else's uh, image as long as you pay what's called attribution. You give credit to the person or the organization who administered the license, who owns the, the work. So Basically, what that means <clears throat> is that you link back, you provide a link uh, where you found the image. And it typically will include also the, the name of the person, but the main thing is to include the link that you say, this, you know, this work comes from this location, right? And you usually include the link and, and maybe the name of, of the person or the, or, or the organization. There are different types of licenses, and I don't want to dive into the different types, but, but generally speaking, any uh, files that you use, any images that you use, you're going to need to use uh, Creative Commons. Okay. Now, you can use uh, anything in the public domain. Public domain means that you can just use, you know, if you find images in the public domain, you don't even have to pay attribution. You can use it however you want, and you do not have to pay attribution. But uh, Creative Commons Search, there are more images to choose from. And I'm going to show you a good way to find images. And this is called the Creative Commons Search. So this is a search that will basically filter the internet and say, OK, these images are going to be under a Creative Commons license. So if I'm looking for images of trees, I, I can be assured that these images now are following under, they fall under a Creative Commons license. So if I wanted to use this, I could download it and then upload it to my ePortfolio. And then I would create a link to, for example, here I would say, I would use this link. Or you could say, go to the images website. So maybe we can go there. So we go here. All right, so I would include this link right here. And I would probably include the name, this person's name. And technically, we would want to include the type of license, which is this here, OK? But the main thing is to include the link. Make sure you include the link back to the image where you found and again, this Creative Commons search, I think, is a good uh, search engine that essentially filters through and uh, searches for images 
for on a particular topic, but that fall under a Creative Commons license. I think Google also does has this ability, but it's a little bit more um, difficult to filter through. You got to click a lot of different uh, options to to filter through the search. But for me, it's just as easy to find this. If you're using DuckDuckGo, I'm a big fan of DuckDuckGo. This is a search engine. You can use what's called the Bang. If you hit the uh, exclamation mark CC for Creative Commons and then type in trees in quick time, you've got images on trees. If I want to find images on homes, I type in exclamation mark CC and then homes and then it takes me directly to these images. I can use all these images. Now you may not like these images, right? But, but the idea is then from here you can try different keywords and, and go from there. All right, so be careful with Creative Commons. Make sure that you have uh, permission, not, I'm sorry, that you are paying attribution to uh, the person or the organization that owns the image. And I will say one thing about if you have images of friends or family, I would suggest for the most part to avoid uploading any pictures that you have of family and friends in your ePortfolio. Uh, there's going to be exceptions and maybe if you really, really are just, if it's a great picture that really, you know, you really want to include, uh, make sure that you get their permission and they can always come back later and say, Hey, I, I don't want my picture on your e-portfolio, right? And you're, you're going to be obligated to take that down. Um, but you know, generally speaking, I would, you know, if it's a picture of yourself or if it's a picture that you took of a tree. But by all means, you can upload it, right? And you know, you as the, a creator, you're basically a content creator now. That you could also license anything that you're posting. Your whole e-portfolio could be licensed under a Creative Commons license. And all you have to do, and we can talk about that later, but it's very simple, right? It doesn't cost anything. You just copy and paste these images, right, and some text. And everything that you're posting, you're saying to someone else, hey, if you want to use my picture that I took of this tree, or if you want to use my face for, uh, you know, something and you want to change it or use it and publish it re in, in another space, then you have rights to do that. Did I have a question? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Um, when using uh, Creative Commons and paste the link, where should we paste it in our website? I mean, in references or next to the photo? Yeah, I would suggest that you post the link fairly close to the image so someone doesn't have to look too far to find the link. Um, it, I would suggest not having a separate section on references in your ePortfolio. I would again include uh, any links in the same, preferably in the same page, the same web page where the image is. So again, people can say, okay, this is this is obvious that it's not the person's attribution. If you look at this example here, guys, this link is actually embedded in the picture here. So if you can do something like this, or maybe the link appears just below the image, then I think that's the best way to, to do it. But yeah, I don't think I would include a separate section at the very, you know, s somewhere else on references. Uh, I wouldn't treat it. Uh, here, I will take it on a case by case basis. We'll look at your examples and how you're designing your your e-portfolio. But I think generally speaking, I would keep the link close to the image. And also the educational philosophy, is it in like talking about in first person or in third? Mm -hmm. I would I would use the first person in the educational philosophy. Okay, so again, think of it like someone asking you in an interview what your educational philosophy is. Well, you could say, well, I think this and my students this, right? So you can use the first person, I think, in the educational philosophy. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, I know this was a lot of information. I really wanted to kind of give you purposefully a lot of information to think about. Uh, you know how to access the presentation. If you go to the, the classroom, 
you should be able to access access this uh, presentation. Please spend some time going through uh, and looking at it and getting some some more ideas about what I'm sharing in the presentation. Again, we're going to have all week to ask questions and work out technical questions that you have and also working on writing a very good unified, coherent and cohesive educational philosophy. One paragraph that is going to express why we teach, when we teach, how we teach, with whom we teach, et cetera. All right, guys. So be thinking about, uh, in next class, be thinking about where you want to post. Again, if you have something already created, I encourage you to continue contributing to that space. If you want to move or you want to create something else, of course, we can do that also. All right. Um, any questions here? Uh, any other questions as we conclude uh, today's live session? Teacher. Um, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Do we? No, no, no. The second, the second essay is already graded or? Um, I'm working on that. I'm going to post grades uh, within a day or two, and uh, we can also talk about any anything that you have, any questions that you have about the third essay. I wanted to wait uh, until this week for you to be thinking about uh, your final products, and any feedback that I provide you in the uh, essay, of course, you can make those changes be before posting to the ePortfolio your final version. Okay, teacher, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions, guys? The grades have been uploaded uh, for, or not uploaded, but they've been modified, updated uh, for the figurative language review, the quiz. Okay, so grades have been posted there. And yeah, you, you can expect your grades for the academic essays here shortly, and we can be working on that as well. And make sure if you're thinking about wanting to redo the first essay, begin working on that if you haven't already this week. You will have, I think, this week and next week to um, work on that. And you can send me uh, messages if you want me to look at that. All right, guys, I think we'll stop there for today. And tomorrow we'll pick up uh, where we left off. Uh, the rest of the class is really going to be kind of me just giving comments throughout, but not speaking so much. Today was just a lot of information I wanted to get out there. But uh, the rest of the week, it's going to be more as an uh, as needed basis as you uh, have questions. Uh, but we need to begin this week with our educational philosophy and thinking about where we want to post our ePortfolio and then begin uploading information from our products uh, that we completed uh, this uh, this semester and tomorrow i'll kind of give a quick review of specifically what those are but essentially all of the most of the assignments that we completed for a grade are going to be uh, included in the e-portfolio all right guys i think we'll stop there for today enjoy the rest of your day and we'll talk to you guys tomorrow take care bye teacher thank you Teacher, goodbye.